about what's going on inside Washington, D.C., what regulators and lawmakers are thinking and working on, and what you and your credit union should be evaluating in terms of risk areas and areas of opportunity. I'm your host, Ann Petros, also Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at NAFQ, and today I am joined by Jennifer Mascott, Assistant Professor of Law and Co-Director of the C. Boyden Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State at the George Mason University Antonin Scalia Law School. Jen is a former law clerk uh, for Justice Clarence Thomas and then Judge Brett Kavanaugh. So she is the perfect person to help us understand everything that transpired during oral argument in the CFPB versus Consumer Financial Services Association of America case regarding the constitutionality of the CFPB's funding structure. So Jen, thank you so much for joining me. I know that your insights will be incredibly valuable for our our credit union members to hear. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be with you. All right. Well, let's dive right into questions about the oral argument. So respondents in this case, the um, CFSA, you know, really focused on the importance of checks and balances. That's kind of how they framed the case from the start um, and talked about the requirement that Congress, you know, have some limits on its funding to federal agencies and you know, talked all about the appropriations clause of the Constitution, which states that no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. So what do you make of the respondent's argument that Congress must specify exactly how much should be allocated to a government agency and then not delegate that authority to the president and federal agencies? So I think the respondent actually tried to be uh, pretty tailored in oral argument about the argument and highlight the significant discretion that's given to the CFPB director under the statute. So undeniably from early on in practice, there have been fairly general appropriation statutes, but they but they typically give a dollar, they, they often would give a dollar amount, or even if they are giving more discretion about reimbursement of uh, costs and charges, there would have been a lot of specificity about the type of activity they were supposed to be reimbursing. So here the question, I guess, is fundamentally whether the CFPB's funding mechanism is significantly more open-ended than what's been appropriate in the past. And so just to give the general context and build on your excellent description at the beginning, um, it is the case that, well, first of all, just to step back for a minute, it's really fascinating to see the Supreme Court, I think, wrestle with the meaning of the appropriations clause. There are many other doctrines and provisions in the Constitution that frequently come up before the court, but this is an area where they have not really um, ruled as frequently in the past, and so it's an open question here, arguably, about the CFPB's funding structure, and so the court was able to delve into a lot of interesting issues. What's the meaning of the clause? What role does history play in terms of evaluating whether there are limits on how Congress can appropriate money. And as you correctly pointed out at the beginning, the relevant limitation here is that no money can be drawn out of the Treasury except by appropriation made by law. So Congress has to obviously authorize it. And there were very important um, accountability uh, interests at play going back to um, British practice and what the founders learned from that and, and concerns over the king engaging in all manner of hostilities without the support of parliament and draining uh, resources of the treasury. The tricky thing is there is another provision in the constitution that does limit appropriations discretion of Congress. And it is very, it's arguably very narrow. It says that to raise and support armies, it can't be done with an appropriation of any longer than two years. Okay. So if, if the Constitution gives one limit there, and then it doesn't impose a similar limit in the Appropriations Clause itself, does that mean that Congress has a, a complete discretion in how it crafts a law to establish a funding structure for an agency? And has it gone so far here that it's not meaningfully appropriating money to the CFPB, but just almost giving it a pot that it can appropriate on its own? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, typically in statutory interpretation, right, you would you would look at those two clauses and say that here it was intentional. Congress made that choice to leave it broad. You know, they know how to explicitly limit that authority and they've done it elsewhere. Um, so I think there was a little bit of that that, that came up in the argument as well. Um, but you know, is the upper limit of of this funding from Congress that you know was discussed quite a bit uh, during oral argument relevant, and why? So that's a great question, and I think to the justices, the justices seem to be honing in on a slightly different, perhaps, um, question. And so, just you know, it's always hard and and, and sort of perilous to try to predict. Uh, really what the justices find important at oral argument, because sometimes they're asking questions strategically or they're asking questions because they are seizing on what they see to be a weakness. And so while it seems important to them, they're actually just um, almost trying to get the oral argument or the oral advocate to make a point that then shows the um, inaccuracy or improper breadth of the advocate's view. But right. what it seems to me is that, you know, Justice Thomas and Justice Alito and their questions were more looking at the overarching question of what is the purpose and what is the role of Congress here versus the role of the executive? And does this structure in a general level violate that? And what's the standard supposed to be? And um, then, you know, justices on the other side were very skeptical. Um, in particular, it sounded like Justice Jackson, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan were pinging a lot of tough questions to um, advocate Noel Francisco about how this funding scheme is any broader than any uh, looked at in the past. And then I would say Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett were really trying to get more um, precision about exactly what aspect of this funding scheme would be a problem. So if we go to how this funding scheme works, essentially by statute, the CFPB is funded out of federal reserve funds. There is an upper cap and the dollar figure that coming up at oral argument was $600 million a year. It's an indefinite appropriation. You don't have to go back to Congress every year because it's in the statute, you get it from the federal reserve. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, well, how do we know how much of the 600 million each year? Well, as the director, deems reasonably ne necessary to carry out the authorities of the Bureau under federal consumer financial law. And so some of the justices were getting um, Noel Francisco to try to say what exactly about that is a problem, because it's it's it there, there doesn't seem to be any evidence, and indeed there's not, that every appropriation has to be reauthorized every year. Right. Um, that's That has was not practiced from early on. So if it's not the indefinite nature, is it the general cap of 600 million? Well, you know, we were dealing with different dollar figures at the time, but back in the founding era, um, under the first and second Congresses, there would have been authority to spend up to a certain amount. So is there a problem with the distinction here that the director gets to choose what's reasonably necessary? And does that trans uh, 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 transform this power into actually almost having given the director the appropriations power to authorize mm -hmm. as he or she deems reasonably necessary without specifying what expenses it's going to have to go toward. And so you wonder if maybe really uh, the, 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 the thing that would be, on, be beyond the pale here is the general nature and the vast nature of the Bureau's powers in the first place, which strike me as making the um, practical side of this significantly different from the Customs Service, which came up a lot of oral argument. The Customs Service mm -hmm. at the founding had very specific tasks. And so when it had discretion to determine how many officers, how many funds were reasonably necessary, it was to carry out duties that had been specified by law very precisely and carefully by Congress, not to engage in vast regulatory and adjudicative power here. And so I think the justices are going to have to wrestle with is there something about that that makes the director here operate in a way where he or she's really appropriating and making policy determinations that should have been left up to Congress? But that seems to be the distinction the court's focused on. Some of these others about the cap and the length of funding don't seem as relevant because there's historical precedent suggesting that's permissible. Right. Right. Yeah, there are plenty of other agencies that have a similar sort of funding structure that came up quite a bit from petitioners. And, um, you know, that that 
cap is adjusted for inflation. So currently it's over 700 million and it petitioners seem to suggest on rebuttal that the CFPB has actually gotten very close to to that cap. Uh, while respondents, you know, kept suggesting that it, the cap is so high, it is almost meaningless. It's, you know, unrealistic. Um, and so what, what should we make of that? Does that play any significant role here, you know, for one party or the other? Well, I think actually one really significant distinction that uh, Noel Francisco raised in his argument and in his brief is we, if we look at where the fees and the funding's coming from. So one distinction here too, in contrast to the custom service from long ago or some of the other agencies, is that often agencies are spending fees that are coming from regulations or actions they're enforcing against the public. So if the custom service of old was expend, was 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 making expenditures, it might have been doing so out of fees that it was collecting by going onto vessels and like imposing penalties right. and that kind of thing. And here, the CFPB director is really spending somebody else's money because it's a Federal Reserve fund. So you don't even have the accountability of the CFPB collecting the money by imposing its own um regulatory requirements and then having to expend its own resources. It's sort of using somebody else's piggy bank. And so I think uh, Noel Francisco was trying to raise that distinction and say that gets at the crux of the tension here, where if we find this structure permissible, one wonders how the constitutional accountability mechanism of Congress having a role by law and limiting an executive agency, um, how that how that comes into play, and it really is a historical practice, uh, a significant um, constraint and intentional part of the founder structure that Congress was going to separately make the authorization for expenditures, and the executive branch was going to sort of be responding by spending that money that had been authorized. And again, it's just a really tricky question where the line comes, uh, where you say Congress is no longer meaningfully exercise its authority. I think it's going to be quite hard because as we've said before, the appropriations clause doesn't actually say what that law has to look like. One, one other point, some of the justices were asking about, in particular Justice Kavanaugh and Barrett, is they were trying to get um, Noel Francisco to address whether it's enough that Congress could act to undo this vast power. So it's not right. as though Congress can never act. If it's motivated to defund the CFPB, it could pass legislation tomorrow saying no more CFPB, no more funding. It, that's true. I mean, it, it definitely in the founding era, if you go back and read the debates, particularly when the first Congress was putting statutes on the books, they definitely understood that it was going to be much more challenging to undo an authority. And so they were often very mindful on the front end, sometimes even putting in sunset provisions authorizing authority only for a certain period of time, because they were very concerned that the House of Representatives in particular will maintain its prerogative of originating uh, revenue raising uh, laws. And they wanted Congress to maintain its tight role in, in, in not only funding, but also uh, taking money from the American public. And that's just not present in this statute here. So is that constitutionally meaningful or is that just Congress has sort of acted irresponsibly here? That's, I think, what the court's going to have to think about. Mm -hmm. So I think you're referring um, to some of the questioning from Justice Kavanaugh, where he you know, disagreed with CFSA um, that this delegation of funding authority is perpetual and that Congress could, you know, change this tomorrow if it if it wanted to. So that you're you're suggesting that that is true if you go back in history and kind of look at how this was all structured from the start um or you know is this meaningful for the well, respondents case well i guess what i'm saying is technically it's true but as a practical matter it's much more challenging once power is given in a sense to go take it back and you reduce that power back. Right. You have to claw it back. They have to meet intent. The legislation, the enactment of it was intentionally difficult. So it's just mm -hmm. not as simple to say that the Congress today can willy nilly go back and undo what the Congress um, 13 years ago did. Now, Justice Kavanaugh or whoever might come back and say, well, but that's irrelevant. Like they could still act and take steps if they have the will. And I guess I'm then making an additional counterpoint, which is true. 
but the but the but the members of Congress back at the founding understood it was going to be a lot more difficult to take power away. Mm-hmm. They felt the difficulty of passing a new law to undo old power was so vast and so um, grand and specific that it made them very cautious in the laws that they passed in the first place, suggesting that they believed to keep their prerogatives to be in charge of legislation, they should be authorizing more limited and more modest grants of power, sometimes putting in place sunset provisions. And so I guess what I'm saying is, you know, there's two ways you could look at it. One is you could say, if we really care about the historical understanding, the members at the time jealously guarded this power. They wanted it to be limited. They knew they shouldn't, it was going to be tough to peel back indefinite power. So maybe we should be cautious today about in our system approving this kind of delegation to the CFPB. The challenging question is, does that make it constitutionally invalid or does this just make it reckless by Congress? And it's gonna have to be constitutionally invalid for the court to weigh in here. Um, But at a minimum, it seems to me systemically, it's certainly a reckless way for Congress to act. Noel Francisco is trying to get the court to say, it's so reckless and so outside of how we've understood this to operate and so different from the way authority was granted at the beginning, that it is now no longer the case that Congress is meaningfully exercising the appropriations authority. It's really the CFPB appropriating money here, just like in other contexts, we'd say um, there's been too much delegation to agencies because they're engaging in policy making or in legislating, which is really Congress's job. So he's trying to make an analogous argument here to appropriations. And I think it's something really worthy of uh, consideration and thought about where that line is and what it means to appropriate money, because it's a really significant power here. Mm -hmm. Um, It was meant to be held by Congress, and the CFPB is obviously um, routinely engaging in activity that's having significant consequences and impact on the American public. I think we heard a little bit of that but in the exchange between Justice Jackson and a uh, respondent, you know, where she posed two different scenarios and kind of interpretations of the appropriations clause and the Constitution. Um, and it just yeah, it came back to how you, you know, interpret what that appropriations clause means and and whether the founders concerns about the unification of the purse and sword leading to tyranny was was really, you know, kind of where we're headed here with with this reckless delegation. Right. It's very it's very significant. It's very weighty. It's very um I think important to to consider. And you know, one thing I would like to see more of personally, whether it's in briefs or arguments, is advocates being willing to drill down on the precise text of the of the law. Because, for example, um, General Prelogger made reference to uh, custom statutes. Interestingly, I didn't see a lot of discussion of them in the government's lead brief in the case. It looks like uh, there's. In the reply brief, uh, General Prelogger discusses a little bit more about the early custom statutes, claiming them as authority for the CFPB structure and basing it on uh, some historians' briefs. But if you go to the historians' brief itself, they also don't actually ever peel down and drill down precisely about what it is in these early custom statutes that they find to be relevant for authority here. And if you go to the custom statutes from 1789, they're very specific. It it is true that the funding references are more general, but the duties that the funding uh, mechanisms are going to be supporting are very specific. They're incredibly detailed. And when it talks about um, securing the collection of the revenue and providing at the public expense and using somewhat discretion or judgment as shall be deemed necessary, It's talking about with the approbation of officers in the Treasury Department. It's talking about carrying out very specific duties. And it's talking about to be used in the performance of duties assigned by law. And so the specificity is coming in that Congress has given very particular uh, tasks and operating procedures to this agency. And they then have authority uh, to spend what's needed to carry that out. And it's just if if we're if we really are saying the historical analog is relevant, that is uh, orders of magnitude different than the specificity of tasks uh, given to the CFPB by Congress, which are very general. And so I think you could make a big distinction saying the general 
broad power given to the CFPB to decide what it should be doing, actions it should be taking, and then take all money it thinks is reasonably necessary to perform those is not in any way really justified as a factual matter by this much more modest, constrained uh, statutory authority given to the first uh, customs department. So I would have liked to see the briefs, I think, quote, particular statutory language they find relevant and actually in a detailed fashion explain and justify if we're going to base today's structure 200 years later on the customs statutes. Tell us why. Tell us how they're relevant. Tell us how they're parallel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seemed to me that you know respondents didn't really have much on that point, you know, to counter the the customs service argument. And that would have definitely been a very interesting debate to have in much more detail to your point. Well, well, I think the respondents had an, I mean, I think the respondents were saying something similar to what I'm saying, which is, you know, if the, if the petitioner is going to use it uh, um, as a way to justify the constitutionality of today's statute and say it's not doing anything different, it would be, it would be helpful to know how, what exactly the comparison is rather than just talking in generality. So I think there was an attempt to pull out from that really big detailed custom statutory scheme language like reasonably necessary and say, oh, aha, that looks like the phrase that's used in today's statute. And the respondent was saying, well, not quite. There's a lot of difference in how constrained the customs authority was by law back at the time. And I would really be intrigued to hear, you know, the petitioner's response to that and hope that the court will consider that carefully Mm -hmm. if it's tempted to use the 1789 customs statutes as precedent for today's vastly different structure. Right. Now, what about this concept of, you know, limitations on the duration of funding. Petitioners argue that that is that there is a limitation on the duration of funding here for the CFPB, and that you know we see similar limitations in statutes throughout history. What does that mean, and why is this limitation important? Well, I think the respondent is trying to use the. Um, general ongoing nature of the appropriation in conjunction, in tandem with the other factors, to say if you add it all together, it makes the CFPB's power here more vast and different from any other agency. It, you know, when you start to look factor by factor, then the petitioner says, well, on this individual uh, factor, we have precedent for um, indefinite appropriations. And I, and, um, and there is there is precedent for more general appropriations. It's very challenging, I think, to make a constitutional argument that an appropriation or authorization of funds is unconstitutional simply because it extends for a length of time. Because like we t- talked about before, and I think you, you mentioned, the uh, provision in the Constitution about appropriating money to the Army says those appropriations can't be for longer than two years. There's no similar limitation here. So if we're just talking about length of time, I don't think the court's going to be able to reach a decision with just that factor in isolation, which is why I think the respondent's trying to roll it together with the grand nature of the Mm -hmm. scheme, uh, which, again, involves taking money out of another agency's fund uh, that's not really related to the CFPB's regulatory authority. The CFPB is not sort of raising on its own by imposing penalties on people and uh, or or taking funds from the public to get that money. So there's not that, 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 that accountability there. And then the reasonably necessary power for the director who already has vast adjudicative, vast regulatory and adjudicative power. And you need all those things together. And it starts to look like we're talking about something that's very different in kind than other appropriation structures. Right. Now, we talked a little bit about the custom service and that statute and, um, you know, petitioners made reference to, um, the, the standing uncapped source of funding for the custom service. Um, you know, do you think that that's a helpful analogy here? You kind of got into wanting to, to get a little more detail about the statute from both sides and sort of argue, you know, all of the specifics about why or why, you know, that isn't relevant. And I guess the the bigger question here is whether it's important that there's really no other agency in history that is 
quite like the CFPB in terms of its funding structure? Well, one thing I think that it really makes sense uh, to think about here is that, you know, as you're pointing out, I think this debate and this issue is arguably broader than this particular case and this particular litigation. Because regardless of how the court decides this particular case, that does not, even if the court says, you know, we, we don't see an appropriations clause issue here, that doesn't mean that this is the right structure as a policy matter, that this is what's best for the country, that it's that it's anything but reckless to give an agency this amount of power. And so I really think that whether it's through the court here pronouncing once and for all for our system of government what the answer is here or 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 leaving more wiggle room and flexibility in the future, that Congress and people who are concerned about our economic institutions, who are concerned about regulatory authority, who are concerned about like liberty and freedom and making decisions, will consider the vast, really unchecked power that's existing here for the director and whether um, it comes because it's violating the text of the Constitution or because it's just there's no meaningful electoral accountability. This is absolutely operating in a fashion, which I think is what was pointed out by some of Justice Alito's questions. Uh, see, looks like it's operating in a fashion that is in tension with the entire point of requiring appropriations to come by law and the entire point of dividing up power between a legislative branch where it's supposed to be very, very challenging to act. And we can see that just these weeks because you know we have a continuing resolution. We had a lot of drama and challenge over the weekend getting that. There've been massive political consequences with an upending of leadership in Congress just yesterday. And, um, it's intentional in our constitutional scheme for it to be challenging and difficult for the political branches to operate. And the founders and the drafters and the ratifiers wanted that tension because it meant there was going to be a break on the process. Action was going to be slowed down. And the appropriations power and the revenue raising authorities are some of the most critical uh, mechanisms of accountability in our system. And it is extraordinarily important to make sure that they are not recklessly being thrown overboard, even if it's just in an ill-advised, unwise uh, like legislative scheme. And so there are many, many ways to uh, bring change in the system. And if your members have concern, if the public has concern, uh, I think really think Congress should look hard mm -hmm. at whether this particular statutory structure, even in some minuscule way, begins to consider um, the constraints that need to be placed on an agency's authority. Mm -hmm. Well, NAFQ, um did file an amicus brief in support of respondents here arguing that, you know, Congress should take a look at at this issue and um you know ultimately the the court should rule in favor of um CFSA affirming the the Fifth Circuit's decision and then staying its judgment so that Congress can take action and resolve the issue here. Um but I want to you know dig a little deeper into this concept of the power that the CFPB has, the the power that the director wields. And I thought the line of questioning from Justice Kavanaugh to respondents was particularly interesting on this point, because he seemed to suggest that, you know, from his perspective, the constitutional issue um, that plagued the CFPB was resolved with the seal of law case, namely the you know single director only removable for cause provision um, in the statute, and that that was what made the CFPB you know quote the most independent agency in American history end quote. So you know Justice Kavanaugh's vote here is an important one certainly you know do you think that we can glean anything about his thinking from this question alone um i mean i thought respondents uh, answer to that question um was relatively persuasive you know that there is another constitutional issue here that the the single director structure was only half of it what do you think well, again, it's perilous, I think, to make predictions. But as you point out, I mean, I think that the, the supervisory structure to Justice Kavanaugh, we know historically is very important. Indeed, he wrote a lot about this on the D.C. Circuit. The and it's some of case. this. Mm -hmm. 
and it's some of the type of um, really uh, persuasive, incisive, I think, analysis that made everybody aware of how qualified he would be to understand the law and, and serve on the Supreme Court. You know, it certainly sounded from the phrasing of his question that he saw that as a paramount problem with the CFPB and is pointing out the court took action to address it. I think respondents correct. You know, fixing one constitutional problem doesn't mean that the agency is free of other problems. And if one believes that there is a meaningful separation of powers constraint in Congress acting by law and that it can't that it should not just delegate huge amounts of discretion to agencies. One might be concerned about questions uh, before the court here. It's, it may not just be enough that once the executive gets power, the president can oversee all of it if we want Congress to be engaged as a policy standpoint. We don't really have as much of a record to look at for Justice Kavanaugh to know how he uh, would rule in these types of delegation questions. The one non-delegation case that was squarely before the court in 2018 in this Gundy decision, uh, which um, looked at the intelligible principle concept. Uh, my recollection is that um, I think that was argued very be before Justice Kavanaugh actually came on the bench that term. And so my recollection is he was not involved in the resolution of that decision. Um, but in any case, one important point is if, if Justice Kavanaugh and the others think removal restrictions are one of the key ways to keep executive power um, accountable, Good news, they're going to have another chance to look at it in the Jarkasi versus or the SEC versus Jarkasi litigation later this term, where one of the challenge, another challenge of this circuit or problem this circuit found with constitutional structure is that the agency adjudicators in the SEC, and then there'd be similar structures in many other agencies, are not constitutionally adequately supervised because they are subject to too many tenure protections, where not only do they have tenure protections, often they're a commissioner sitting over them of tenure protections. And that if that's not enough to actually remove an ALJ, you have to convince the Merit Systems Protection Board that there was justification and there are tenure protections there. So if wow. this is Talk really about what we're now, <laughs> so there's really, if this is our accountability, get ready because we've got some agency adjudicators who might be causing some trouble under that whole view. So wow. we'll see. All right. So TBD on on that question, but <laughs> definitely a, a, an interesting point to to think about. Now, I know you said, and I agree that it is um, a perilous activity to to try to predict what the Supreme Court may decide. Um, you know, we're anticipating a decision probably in the um, second quarter of 2024. So, you know, by the end of of June, at some point, we'll know um, how. All of the justices, you know, landed in in this case. But what was your overall takeaway from the oral argument? You know, if you had to guess, what what do you think are the range of possibilities? Let's put it that way. I mean, I think a number of justices in their tone expressed a lot of skepticism about the various arguments being raised. And I think the justices are going to look very closely at history and think um, and also look very closely at how much general constitutional concerns and the separation of powers comes into play here. And the purpose of the appropriations limitation plays against the specifics of past practice and that we might really have an opportunity in the way the decisions are written to, to get a lot of insight about the methodology the justices are going to use when they're facing some of these grand constitutional questions here for the first time. And so I think it's going to be really um, potentially uh, a set of insightful decisions to uh, to understand the justices approach to the Constitution moving forward. Are you at all concerned about what a decision um affirming the lower court's decision could mean for the CFPB's regulations. Um, you know, the, the Mortgage Bankers Association brief was cited in oral argument, you know, raising uh, a lot of concerns about you know, what this could mean for mortgage originations and mortgage servicing and all of those rules and the safe harbors there. I mean, personally, I'm not concerned. This comes up in every argument. You know, the, the side that does not want there to be a constitutional violation found always 
talks about the range of negative possibilities. And at the end of the day, if the justices are, you know, examining cases, they know they have to look at the Constitution and the text of the law. Um, they can certainly be mindful of consequences and practicalities when they are fashioning remedies and deciding how they're going to phrase, you know, the violation in a particular case. Mm -hmm. And they often do fashion remedies with those practicalities in mind. Uh, but, you know, but the, at the end of the day, if we let concerns about um, policy consequences govern grand constitutional holdings, uh, we're going to end up with a government practice that looks far different from what uh, was ratified and approved to govern us um, a couple of hundred years ago. All right. So what I'm hearing is, you know, all of that should be put to the side and we've got to stick to, you know, the intent of the framers of the Constitution and, you know, what's in the in the text of the Constitution as well. I mean, that's my view. But, you know, I'm a con law professor, so, you know, <laughs> it's to be expected, right? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Anyway. Well, any any other you know closing remarks for our viewers and listeners today? Uh, just thanks so much for having me. And again, you know, th we're, this is obviously giving us opportunity to think about what the Supreme Court's going to be doing. But that it is an institution is the final backstop for justice and constitutionality. And so, uh, again, regardless of the outcome of this case, it does not. It does not close the book on whether the CFPB's regulatory authority, adjudicative power, funding scheme, size of budget is correct, is wise, is in the interest of the American public. And, you know, people should continue examining, studying those questions and bring concerns to Congress. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, just in legal challenges alone, there are other, uh, you know, challenges in the works, and I'm sure more to come. Um, so we will stay tuned. All right. but, <laughs> thank you so thank much, you. Jen, for, for joining me for this uh, breakdown of the oral argument before the Supreme Court in the CFPB versus CFSA case. Uh, thank you to all of our viewers and listeners. If you enjoy watching The Cup, please hit the subscribe button, hit that like button, turn on your notifications for uh, posts about future episodes, and let us know what you'd like to hear about in a future episode. We always love hearing from our and listeners. So thank you again for tuning in. Until next time.